This is WPSL Fort St. Louis. find a business partner with a little bit of money. Give Warren Buffett a call. Uh, he's looking. If he wants to buy any burgeoning broadcast operations. <laughs> oh my. Money Info brought to you by Princeton Research with Mike King in Las Vegas. Charles Moskowitz in Boston. Hey, good uh, good morning, guys. Good morning. What do you say? <laughs> Tim Connolly in Houston, Texas. Tim Connolly. Oh, sell that Good man an oil all. well. Yep, yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, actually, there was a point in time where you you couldn't give them away. Yeah, well, and, and now, <laughs> what did I just see? Today, it's, what, 63 bucks a barrel? That's very cool. Uh, some very interesting news. Shell came out yesterday with a report that they are uh, projecting a shortage of LNG within the next 24 to 36 months because of the lack of ability to deliver it to overseas buyers. And then the uh, CEO of Polarian Gas gave an interview this morning that was very similar to that, that the infrastructure is not being built fast enough to get LNG to buyers. So very, very interesting stuff out in the news today. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, aren't all the power plants going that route? Oh, absolutely. And, and we have the infrastructure to get it to our own power plants, but we don't have the infrastructure to get it to some of the shipping points that the foreign buyers prefer. So, for instance, New York absolutely is not allowing any LNG flow through any pipeline there. And so it's therefore impossible to get LNG offloaded in New York to go overseas. And uh, there's a variety of other bottlenecks developing because of the uh, municipalities like New York City um, refusing to allow it to happen. And so is that bullish or bearish? <laughs> well, I think. Uh, I well, think I mean, if it, you know, if it's all sitting in storage, then not great. Um, from the standpoint of it's sitting with nowhere to go, you know, the Cushing story. Um, right. And so, you know, what do they do with it? Well, um, Shell's view is that that bottleneck is a temporary issue. And they believe that it can continue to be shipped and come out of other harbors than the perfect one. And largely because of the Jones Act is why New York is saying it's all about environmental, it's all about the unions. But Shell's opinion... So also comes, minorly about terror, terrorism. Yes. Because they're yeah. not crazy about sending fully loaded LNG under the Verrazano Bridge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That, yeah. That, that, no, that I'm actually... Not, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I was serious. I, you know, I've heard that. Okay, but... Uh, um, yeah. Asking well, well, a real... And, and there is some... That's legitimate. Yeah. Well, that's a legitimate concern because these LNG super tankers can explode like a nuclear bomb. So yeah. that, they're, that's a legitimate concern. Okay, so, okay, let's back up a little bit. It's something that was just kind of dropped in in the conversation by our friend from Houston. <laughs> Why would the unions be objecting to this? The Jones Act is a U.S. act that prohibits any U.S. shipper from using anything other than unionized crews. Oh, okay. So yep. it literally prevents Houston, Freeport. Um, we have a number of LNG facilities now that are exporting overseas, and yet 
we could sell a tremendous amount of it to New York, but they can't land in New York Harbor because the cost of union help is so much higher that it doesn't justify the revenue for selling it into New York. And it's purely the Jones Act, purely 100 percent. But but that'll change if the price doubles, I'm assuming. Uh, Yes, but if the price doubles and the demand is out there, this quote from Shell uh, yesterday, actually, is the uh, Shell's director of integrated gas said yesterday that we are seeing significant demand expansion from importers in Asia and Europe, and we are also seeing LNG provide flexible, reliable, and cleaner energy supply for other countries around the world. And in Asia alone, demand this year rose by as much as Indonesia, the world's fifth largest exporter, produced in 2017. So Uh they're seeing some data points that they are actually very bullish on pricing and bearish on supply by, I think it was 2020. Yeah. Hold on. And that seemed so far off, but here we are. You know, a third of the way into sure. 18. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah. Well, now, uh, yeah. something else. So, is wait, go- wait, wait. Let me ask yeah, you go ahead. Let me ask go you ahead. something, Tim. Um, so, those Asian markets, do we have the same situation there on the price structure? I mean, what are they willing to pay today versus what you can see in Houston? For supply. Well, the interesting thing is this. They're paying more because they want to do spot pricing, and they're trying right. to avoid long-term contracts. So in the near term, they're paying more, but they're not agreeing to long-term contracts, so they're not assuring their long-term supply. Uh-huh. Shell, uh, this is the quote. Shell noted that a mismatch in requirements between buyers and sellers is a growing trend. Most suppliers seek long-term LNG sales, but LNG buyers increasingly want shorter, smaller, and more flexible contracts so they can compete in their own downstream power and gas markets, meaning they'd rather go ahead and adjust upward in the near term on pricing than have a long-term contract. Where's Edron when you need it? (laughs) (laughs) Why did I know that that was going to creep into this conversation Well, you know, I mean... Well, first of all, it's a local story, but second of all, it has all to do with trading. And, you know, if you think that nobody's noticing, you're wrong. Somebody will pop you're, up. You bet. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and something else that seems to be going on uh, in in uh, lovely Tejas, um, uh, is it true that Warren Buffett's looking at buying Southwest Airways? Well, I, I, I don't know that that's true because I've heard those rumors, and it's not – he certainly has not been a big fan of the airlines for a long time. So I, I'm not sure that's just no, know, but, gossip. No, but as a matter of his track record, let's remember he made a ton of money the last time he was in airlines with somebody who got taken over. I'm trying to remember – who it was, um, but it was a regional uh, that expanded dramatically, that got bought for a massive premium, and then he got out of them for 20 years, and now he's back in airlines per se. Um, but, uh, you know, I think all of the talk about him with Southwest is, you know, kind of like 16 guys who are in the investment banking side yeah, of they're, the business. They're long who, who are airline. saying this this <laughs> could happen. This should make I mean, you know, and all it makes all of the economic sense in the world and the psychology of it is there. But that's about it. Well now I've found where this came from. He made a comment in an interview last night uh, that was quoted on C N B C that he wouldn't rule out owning an entire airline. That was, oh, okay. That was the cool. Yeah, well, he wrote his his uh, his annual letter was released Sunday. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of talk around him. And Becky Quick on CNBC had him on from six o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock, 
and I can't watch it anymore. Uh, he's a little too folksy for me. And, you know, talking about his hindsight and what's going on, you know, gets old after a while. Well, he's a big fan of the new tax plan because it added billions and billions in value to Berkshire Hathaway with their yeah, of course. booking of gains on the new tax uh, rates. And, and, I have and a, frankly, there'll be a lot, if, it, if the trend continues, there'll be a lot more on the dividend side because dividends and buybacks seem to be where most of the money goes, regardless of, you know, how many companies give $1,000, you know, well, bonus to their... Well, their workers. I, I want want to give you the most concrete example of the trickle down effect of this. I was at Starbucks doing my early morning meeting this morning, and there is a teacher who is retired but still teaches part time helping people, and she just got a letter from the Texas Teachers Retirement System that her pension payment, due to the new tax rate, is increasing a net of $137 a month, effective immediately. Now, there are thousands and thousands of retired teachers throughout the United States. And when you think about that, that this is something that's going to happen in every pension plan because they do withholding for the income taxes, and they're lowering the withholding amount. What wonderful news that was. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And secondly, here's an even better example. Yesterday, we have a new client in here, a family office out of Louisiana, owns 62,000 acres of producing land of both agricultural products and oil and gas. Last year, after taxes, they made $22 million on their operations. This year, after taxes, they will make $30 million. And they are taking their cash flows and going out and buying $250 million worth of more producing properties. So it's a perfect example of people taking their tax savings and reinvesting them. So yeah. and, people aren't all going know, out and, there and buying back right. stocks. And this, uh, if everybody knows who Kevin Leary is, Kevin O'Leary, oh, you bet. who is a failed money manager uh, who now has uh, – uh, a series of ETFs under the umbrella of O shares. Um, I can't stand the guy, but if they took the words I and me out of the vocabulary, he'd have nothing to say. But the fact of the matter is that (laughs) he made the... Yeah, Mr. Wonderful. In In the meantime, he made a valid point talking about the companies he would invest in for exactly that reason. If you have a tax cut, companies that were paying X are paying now two-thirds of X, or whatever the number happens to be in their industry and in their situation, and, you know, the PEs have to be adjusted up because the earnings will be adjusted up. And so, you know, you see a lot of that. You see a lot of it all across the um, you know, all across the economy, regardless of what our friends in the House and Senate say should or shouldn't, will or won't happen. You know, well, there. and we can we can only hope that the follow-on growth is as great or greater than people thought, and that it's not all 1.5 trillion in deficit spending because it is a huge, huge benefit for a lot of people, and I was so thrilled to see this woman's eyes light up telling me about this this morning. Yeah, She was a teacher for 35 years, and here she's retired now and lives on a fixed income and just got and a $137 got a month raise. Right. Now she's wow. got a $1,500 increase in, in, in yep. uh, benefits. That's great. That, yep. that, that's Pretty really wonderful. awesome. That is really awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, what do you, um, you know, I just looking at the CNBC and, uh, uh, they're talking about the new Fed guy and that, you know, uh, he says there's going to be rate hikes, and uh, but he still thinks there's going to be 30,000 uh, Dow. I mean, do you, <laughs> do you see that? Oh, yeah. He's testifying right now in Congress. And I was going to say, I'm looking at him testifying as we speak. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And well, he's the first sainted, non-academic also. As my sainted great-grandmother used to say, but with her Irish brogue, 
from his mouth to God's ear. <laughs> I'd love to see if we could withstand four interest rate increases, which is what people seem to be talking about, three to four. So that's 100 basis points this year. And maintain a 30,000 Dow. That would be miraculous. That would be pretty yeah. amazing. Because people have gotten spoiled. Ten years of 3% money. I mean, I have clients who have bank loans that have had 3% ceilings on their interest rate for the last several years. Those are the really big players. 3% ceilings. And uh, just for the public side of it, um, housing contracts and um, building, you know, a new, new building reported yesterday and was dramatically down. Yep. And, and the no reason surprise. that they're talking about is because, you know, uh, mortgage rates were three and three quarters and now they're four and a half. You know, good. Yeah. In the meantime, yeah, there are no... plenty of people who paid 15 yeah. on their <laughs> home loans. I remember those bought days. The houses and did just fine. Yeah. In those wonderful days that Jimmy Carter was president. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I think we I think Carol and I were paying was it I think 18% or something like that in our house in San Diego. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, it was my it was, God. it was an insane time, but we oh. are seeing that here too. I'm in the middle of doing a turnaround on a large development in Houston here that was almost foreclosed October 2nd, and we have seen since January 2nd a tremendous number of high-end houses come on the market for sale, and traffic drop dramatically. I mean, I'm talking by 75%. So we're going to see the, the the market that gets hurt here is house, and I don't care what people say. Oh, no, no, it's not going to make a big difference. Charles is dead on. It's going to make a difference. Yeah, it it's is like, a difference. It's like it's interest not going rates, to. It is. It's like interest rates can are okay if they're going up for the right reason? Yes, because you saw what happened when rates moved up. I mean, you know, in the long term, makes all the sense in the world. In the short term, the velocity of the rate rise scares a lot of people. And where we're seeing the benefit I mean, rates have is, doubled. I've seen, we wrote a permanent loan on an office building last month at 5%. But to get that same loan today is five and seven eighths in one month. Well, what's happening is most of the commercial owners are now rushing to get things done. I have a whiteboard that's filled with about nine transactions right now because everybody's worried if they don't fix now, it's liable to be six or seven next year. And so wow. I, oh, really? I'm the busiest I've been in five years. And back to the trickle down. In case nobody noticed, Macy's has doubled off its low and is up two and a half dollars this morning at thirty because retail sales are picking up. Dillard's the exact same way, up you know, twenty odd percent. Same thing. Now Macy's is up three dollars and thirteen cents at thirty fifty eight. Uh, I mean, you know. I don't care what the politicians who are running for office tell me. You know, I mean, and it's somewhat of an unfair um, comparison because now they are um, coming up against absurdly low comps from a year ago when things were really bad. But the fact is people are spending money. You know, it's very interesting, though, you say that, and, and it's like, uh, what I was uh, saw yesterday afternoon, I guess um, the uh, toy manufacturers like Mattel, they yep. really took it in the back because uh, Toys R Us are closing so Going many stores. On. Yeah, and, and yeah. the distribution is demolished. Well, but it's not really. I mean, they still sell in like Walmart and Target and places yeah. like that. Um, I do understand that, but I just can't understand why an individual company like Mattel would just be hurt. It went down like 5% or something like that. It was huge. Yeah, 
And um, yeah, but there's you have to remember Mattel is kind of an unusual situation because there was talk of a turn uh, of a uh, takeover that never materialized with the stock up. Then there was uh, an actual bid that was failed and took the stock back down. Uh, I mean, I think probably what you're going to have to see, um, and you know, they're going to do it in the face of Walmart and online from Amazon and online from Walmart. You know, the same thing that happened in the shoe business where uh, Nike is offering a lot of their stuff through the company website as opposed through the foot lockers of the world and uh, those others. I think, you know, if you start to see that in uh, the toy business, you know, it'll, it'll really be a problem for, uh, you know, for distribution. But they'll also pick up distribution where they have a massive, better profit because they're not selling it to a wholesaler. They're selling it at a discount, but a discount from retail, which, you know, everybody knows can be 30, 40 percent of their cost of goods sold. Well, I thought you were going to say that the FBI was going to okay the shoe companies to sell all their all their stuff in, in uh, college bookstores. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, oh. <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, you know, the, um, those FBI wiretaps, man, um, I've known him for a long time, and I'm thinking, oh, his career is done. I mean, yeah. that coach is toast. Um, I don't know who touch him now. Uh, I, if it, you know, if it's all true, I, you know, who knows? But you know, I believe- hey, let me let me give you a quick quote out of Powell. This just came up, and you're Uh-oh. Right Uh-oh. back where you're talking about. He just said the Fed is not going to continue to buy mortgage securities, and they are going to be liquidating that portfolio. And that is not going to help rates at all. Ooh. Just the game across. Oh, five billion dollars. So wow. when you've got when you've got a combination of the economy heating up and the Fed selling mortgage-backed securities, that that could create a problem. We'll yeah. see. And he says Again, now nobody, we're, we're looking at a really fifty cares. billion dollar balance sheet runoff. Haven't we seen fun. that movie before, Tim? <laughs> Yes, we have. Oh my yes, God, we have. So it's it's a good time to uh, be very careful and and keep some cash on hand because rates are going up. Wow, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's going to be interesting. Now the other thing is, as he said, we're going to largely do it in runoff, which means payoffs. But right. he just commented, but we are going to see a slowdown in the refinancing market. So our payoffs will slow down also. It's very interesting, very nuanced discussion going on right now. Yeah. I was always amazed that when rates were 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 on the 10-year, why they didn't hit the market with some of that and actually take gains at the same time as reducing their balance sheet. (laughs) Because when you're the bidder... (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> when you're the bidder driving down the rate, you can't very well be the seller, too. We've yeah. tried that. Guys have gone to jail for that if they want the government. <laughs> I was, I was, I was going to say that sounds a little illegal there, you know. Uh, uh, you know, a little good old fashioned spoofing. <laughs> oh man, oh. But well, you know, I, I, I mean, it's interesting. You talk about the ta- new tax and and you know the teachers' pensions. Um, did you hear some of those stories coming out of California on the uh, pension plans out there that are woefully, and I mean woefully, underfunded, like maybe just 20%? If that, you know, I mean, that is scary as hell, you know, when you think about that. And that's scary as hell, but what do you think about the fact that the same situation exists with uh, um General Electric, who now is going to restate two years of Two numbers. years. Yeah. Oh. 
<laughs> and, Welcome and, to the big league, heard, Mr. Flannery. <laughs> yeah, I've heard from, uh, I've heard not from personally, but on TV, uh, I've heard a bunch of guys saying, you know, they're way underfunded for pension. And the yeah. company now appears as if for the last two or three years it was, you know, being dramatically misrepresented as to what the company actually did and made and was successful in. I, mean, I don't think we'll be seeing Jeffrey Immelt on CNBC very often. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely not. And, and well, I wrote last night in my note um, about this, and, you know, basically... Uh, I'll wait to buy GE, which is, you know, $14 and change. We tried to buy it at 15 and change when it bounced to the upside and looked like it was going higher. But the fact Mr. of the Rick. matter is, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to sit back and wait until wait they for drop 10. it from the Dow. Wait for 10. No, when they drop it from the Dow. The same thing yeah. that happens when they dropped, we, we were in, we bought not we're in, but we bought uh, Alcoa, a company that at the time had an $8.5 billion market cap that now is market capped at $20 billion. And uh, Telephone, which was, repla- the, was replaced by Apple, which at the time they dropped it was uh, $32, and in very short order was $44.00 and is still now in the 38-39 area. So, uh, you know, when they drop it from the Dow, that's when it will be better. Wow. Are you- All right, gentlemen, I hear you've got another guest waiting for you, so I'm going to yeah, drop welcome, off. Yeah, Rick Schumacher. Take it oh, Bioscience. All right. All right. Hey, Timmy, uh, thank you uh, so much, and uh, we'll be uh, talking with you soon. Uh, one final thing on that GE, uh, Charles, uh, are you actually talking about the Dow delisting? GE? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And it will. Really? It's the only one of the original left. Damn. By the way. Really? That, that, yeah. that blows me away. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you, you know, the thing is, they don't want a stock that will not be representative of, uh, you know, what's actually going on when, you know, it's price weighted. So it would take a double. In, uh, in GE versus maybe a 10% move in any of the big names to be the equivalent. I mean, you know, Goldman, it's about 13 times. So if, uh, if a Disney or a, uh, an Apple or any of the other big names go up a dollar, you get $13.00. In the Dow, that's about what the denominator is right now. The denominator for GE is probably 0.4 as opposed to 13. So, you know, it just doesn't have any effect. Well, now, so what's the point of having it be there? Wow. That's we amazing. should put Pressure Bio in there. Well, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> uh, why, why don't we just get Rick to take over GE? I like the way you guys think. <laughs> yeah, we, we we wouldn't we wouldn't want Rick we wouldn't want Rick to have to be straddled, you know, with all of the debt and and you know misbegotten numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He at that, least has a clean company. That's uh, well, Rick. How you been? It's it's been a long time, my friend. I've been well. I've been well. How are you? Uh, we're we're all doing uh, doing okay. Uh, what's going on at uh, Pressure Bio? Well, you know, I'm down here in lovely New York City, in the middle of Manhattan, uh, speaking up, uh, talking up the company with some some people, uh, which I do uh, a couple times a month, and uh, seems to be working. Stock's been uh, been acting a lot better in the last uh, few weeks versus uh, the end of last year. So uh, that's uh, part of my job, of course. And of course, sure. part of my job is to go meet Charlie, who I've never met, and, and he's in Boston, and I'm in Boston, so I'm not sure why we haven't met. Well, you know, we'll but to, see, see, Charles, Charles is uh, out there in the beach area. You know, I mean, he's 
he's one of those, you know, beach guys. So, well, I'll yeah. force myself to go to the beach. Okay. <laughs> so we've been we've been busy, and uh, we just came back. I didn't go, but my my key scientist went uh, um, to San Francisco. There was a meeting. It's a, it's a pretty large meeting. It's about seven thousand scientists once a year that meet on what's called the Biophysical Society, and these are are, are scientists that are working with. Uh, uh, trying to you know discover the next preventive strategy, the next uh, cure, and and uh, they do a lot of work with what's called spectroscopy, and uh, we did a uh, we announced a a collaboration with a company that's a terrific small company's been around for about 30 years called ISS, and uh, and we did a collaboration with them. They we have something in common. They sell a spectroscopy system. Which uh, which reads through uh, wavelength, and that system is about a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar system, and we sell a pressure system that uh, goes for you know thirty to thirty five thousand. But in between, uh, they sell uh, ISS sells what's called a pressure cell. This is a like a box, and and the reaction that scientists are looking at, putting things together and see how they react, is done inside that box, and then it's read by the by the machine, the spectrophotometer. But they, they also sell a box that can make the reaction happen under pressure. And uh, a lot of things happen. Some things are very, very interesting and give us a lot of insight when it's done under pressure. It speeds things up. It makes things happen in a, in a very uniform way. And they have been generating their pressure using uh, all different methods, their customers. And so we did a deal with them because we have, we think, the best way for their customers to generate pressure, which is an automated uh, system, a pressure generator that just that will give you any pressure from from a thousand pounds per square inch up to uh, up to fifty eight thousand pounds per square inch, and they're they're looking at these reactions at pressures of twenty, thirty, forty thousand psi, and they're learning a lot by looking at the reaction under pressure versus under normal pressure, which we're under is 14 and a half is high. And, um, but they're having to, some people, believe it or not, guys are cranking up a wheel to get to pressure. They're turning a wheel like we did 30, 40 years ago to get to pressure. And we have a system that you dial it into the computer, you automatically, instantaneously, in less than a second, get to that pressure. And you can jump around different pressures. You can slope it. You can run you can set it at 30,000 PSI, and then every minute it goes down 1,000 PSI. And scientists will learn from this. But the scientists using the pressure cell from ISS, um, some started buying our system, and so it kind of put us together in the last two years, three years. So we met uh, in Boston in December and shook hands and did a deal and kind of announced it uh, last week and the week before last. And we're very excited about it because it, it – uh, it, uh, it adds another um, uh, group of customers that we generally would not see, customers that are buying the ISS spectrophotometer and pressure cell who would then go out and buy their own generator. Now they're coming. Now they'll be coming to us. So it's really, really exciting for us. I, I, f- I, would think I, I find that- it hard to believe, the Rick, the, <laughs> that someone could actually be using 30- or 40-year technology in such a space age area that you guys are in, I just find that really yeah, hard. To I believe. mean, the 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 degree of accuracy attained versus the other example of the you know turning the wheel manually would have to be dramatically increased. I mean, dramatically. Uh, so many things. Uh, the, the the thing that is. Dramatic, you know, once you get to pressure, pressure is pressure. So if you turn a crank, literally turn a crank for two or three or five minutes and you get to 35,500 PSI, and I get there in an in a instant at 35.5 in an automated system, 35.5 is still 35.5. But the other guy took him, you know, five, seven minutes. And then when he wants to go down to 30 to see the effect on the reaction, he's got to turn the wheel the other way. Or crank it the other way. We simply dial it into the computer and say, "Go to 35.5 for two minutes. 
then go to 25.5, then go to 37.2. Whatever the numbers are that our experiments have shown are the best numbers to, for a reaction to occur. And it does it on, you can go have a, you know, go do another experiment while this is going on. Whereas with the old 30, 40 year old technology, you got to be there to be cranking it yourself. So, yes, but you know, it, some of it is because we're a small company with one salesperson and, and people have never heard of us. And I don't look at that as a bad thing. I look at that as a, as a tremendous opportunity. Because we're small, because we've been nine people for the last 10 years, because very few people have heard of us. That's not bad. What that says is 99.9% of the available market is still there for us. We just have to get the means, and that's what we're doing. As you know, we've hired four salespeople in the last few months, and now we're going to get – and these are field salespeople. They all have a territory in the U.S., and now that we're doing collaborations with other companies and we're doing mailings and marketing and co-marketing, I think the, the, the times for people to have not heard of us are going to come to an end over the over the coming months and, and year or two. And that's exciting because that means more opportunity for us. Wow. That's yeah, a, oh, it's a great story. Amazing, yeah, it is. It is. What's the stock look like, Charles? Um, one second. Um, you know, it, it's quiet. Um, it has been in, you know, a, a period of you know, some consolidation now since last September with a range of about 270 to, you know, four and a half, which seems like a pretty decent range. But the fact of the matter is it's, you know, it's been going sideways. And, uh, you know, technically speaking, the longer a stock goes sideways, the bigger the move is once it actually breaks a high to the upside or, you know, uh, obviously, to the downside the same way, but you know the stock is uh, down over you know a period of uh, years, and that would certainly it, it certainly looks more like um, lack of info and lack of uh, attention rather than any real problem. Well, if I can jump down. I can jump in and remind our, our listeners that, you know, we we embarked on a course about a year and a half ago, um, and that course was to uh, get permission from shareholders to do a reverse split, do the reverse split, and and uh, hire an investment bank and tr move the company up to the Nasdaq Stock Exchange. Uh, we right. did the uh, we did the reverse split. The stock actually went up after the reverse split. If you look, we did it on June fifth. If you look at the at the numbers in June, you see the number, the, the stock actually went up after the reverse split. Then we filed uh, our final uh, S1 uh, to, to go out and raise the $12 million, and the stock got, got hammered. And um, then the, the bank we hired was not able to raise the $12 million, and the stock got even more hammered. So we're now sitting, you know, when, when Charles said we're, we're sitting between 270 and $4, uh, those are prices – we never saw before uh, six months ago, eight months ago. We we never been below seven dollars and fifty cents. We've been as high as is you know fifty, sixty dollars five years ago, uh, even even a year and a half ago, eighteen dollars. But once we embarked on this and and the and the money was not raised, uh, you know Wall Street didn't forgive the not raising the money. So the company is doing well. I continue to uh, to uh, within limits tell people. Uh, that the company's doing well. I think everyone should expect us to have a um, a first quarter that goes beyond any first quarter we've ever had before. I've said that I've said that publicly, and uh, this I've said this year should be a banner year for us. My gosh, look at look at what's happened. Last year we had one salesperson and one instrument, and uh, and uh, this year we have five salespeople. We have a second instrument. That is, uh, we have four more instruments I've said will be out this year. They're all uh, little, they're very close to the first one, but they don't cannibalize it. They, they take larger samples or they, or they run them faster. They do things differently, so they won't cannibalize the, the main instrument we have, the flagship instrument out there. Uh, but they will add, we think, to our revenue. So we're looking for a good year, and yet the stock, I tell people, to, to for whatever reason, the stock has not responded. The stock is still where it was 
when when we failed, uh, when the bank failed to raise the money last August, the stock went to four, and, and as Charles just said, we're sitting at four. We've been between four and five for the last few days, but uh, it hasn't even gotten back to, to where it was uh, before I went out on the road to raise the money last July. Yeah, there's also an interesting thing that happens when companies do reverses. Um, first of all, they end up with a lot of small shareholders who just immediately sell the stock just because they're, you know, fed up and they have an odd lot and, you know, they're just, they lose interest. But on the other side of that coin, if a company is reversed one for 30, which is what happened here, all of a sudden you only have 3.3%, the number of shares outstanding. And so when there is positive news, there's a dramatically smaller float available for people to buy, and it generally uh, results in a fairly sharp rise on any good news. This is the same thing that we've talked about relative to some of the other companies that we've dealt with where the market cap is a couple of million dollars, and they're talking about having an order for a half a million or a million or a million and a half dollars. And what people don't realize is that the fact is it's only a million or a million and a half, but the fact is that also the market cap is only that. And so the result in the stock is dramatically increased and and you know uh, works out very much better than when the company had 30 times more shares outstanding. Rick, what and I would add what one is, more thing to it, Joe, yeah, go, go ahead. Thing, which is which is that we are down to 1.3 million shares. We had 32 million uh, this time last year. We have 1.3 million. And uh, as you say, probably many of the small shareholders have jumped out over the last six months. I, I can't tell you for sure. There, but also, most of the people that, that are in there are people that have purchased the stock at much higher prices. And, uh, and I think there's a reluctancy to sell when this company is, is selling and touching its all-time lows while it's putting out good news. Most people are thinking and hoping it's just a short-term blimp, and they're holding on to it. So there is not a lot of stock available, and uh, I think that uh, that probably you know bodes well for a uh, for the investors. That sounds great. And again, you know, a million dollar a million dollar order in a five million dollar company is meaningful, but a million dollar order in a million dollar company is dramatic, and that's the kind of look that. These stocks with dramatically less shares outstanding go through. Rick, uh, what's the reaction uh, of uh, uh, the uh, the folks that your salesmen are calling on? Um, what has been the reaction to uh, Pressure Bio? The reaction uh, is just coming in now because these guys are just getting out. We we hired uh, we hired them in the fall and and they are. They, we had to put them through about three months of training, but sure. they, I said earlier that they started going out in January. Uh, I think the reaction is is one of um, what's going on. We've never seen a sales rep before. I had no idea you, you, you could use the instrument for this. I had no idea you had these new consumables. What is this uh, collaboration you just did with ISS? So we have we have a, a, a we now have a pathway of getting information to our customers and the new customers that we've never had before. Literally, and I'm not proud of it, but I think people understand, we, we went through you know years where the only time we could see our customer was at if they attended a scientific meeting because I had one salesperson and she couldn't travel because she spent most of her time shepherding you know orders through the system, which could take two weeks or, or three months. And so right. we would rarely see the customers. It's totally different now. Every one of our customers is going to have a visit from their salesperson. Every one of our customers is going to be, uh, uh, we're going to explain to them exactly what we have and, and other ways of using the instrument versus the way that they, they the reason they bought it. And so have you, have you had much contact? Have you had much contact with uh, 
universities? Yes. Oh, yes. We we have um, we have uh, our, our our system is sold into academic labs, and uh, it's also sold into biotech, biopharma, and government. So across the right. board. I mean, we have systems at the FBI, the FDA, the CDC, and the NIH, but we also have systems at the uh, University of Minnesota, at at like four of the University of California. UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, uh, UC Davis. Um, so we are we're at Boise State. We're we're at uh, uh, we have system at Harvard. We have a system at Stanford. So yes, Rockefeller right here down the street. I can see it from my from the, my my view here from my the office. Somebody let me let me use for the phone call. Um, we do. So we have wonderful academic customers. But what's we also the have um, acquisition cost for the academics? We give them a 5% discount, so uh, the academics know that they're going to get a 5% discount right off the bat, and then most of them negotiate hard to get something more. Uh, right. You know, so but what's so the number? Speaking, oh, the, the number, the, the list price of the instrument is $49,900. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, that's, you know, that and certainly it doesn't it hurt any in, of them. No, it sits in front of... Uh, Generally, a lot of academics are buying it to sit in front of their mass spectrometer, which is a machine that reads proteins, and that machine runs between four and 500,000 up to over a million. So we give them an instrument that we think gives them a better result for 50,000 on top of the 500 they've already spent. So it's, um, it's, it's not a big issue. The biggest issue is getting known and, and, and having an a ability to show the data. Wow. And that, of course, we're, we're ending by, by hiring a sales team. It's a big jump for us, uh, Greg and, and, and all. Um, it's a big jump. Uh, we've had one person for nine years. As of, this, as of next Monday, we have five people. We have a, a fifth one starting uh, next Monday with uh, about 10, 12 years of ex- experience selling in this uh, research environment. So uh, we're very excited to finally have a sales team to bring the message out rather than just hoping it filters to everybody. Well, and when you were uh, rattling off some of the universities, I mean, they're some of the most famous research universities in the United States. And we have them around the world. We have, uh, we have the, the, the number one, most people would consider the ETH uh, in Zurich as the, uh, let's call it, they call it the MIT of Europe. Uh, we have the number one protein chemist in the world, Professor Rudy Abersold, he's at the ETH in Zurich, and he has three of our instruments. And we also have instruments throughout uh, Europe, throughout Asia, you know. But we have about 300, 300, instrument, 300 instruments placed in about 175 labs. We think, we think there are as many as 80,000 labs that could possibly use our instrument. Wow. But we've got to be realistic. If there's 80,000 labs that can use it, some won't have the money, some won't have the desire, blah, blah, blah. So, But still, it's in the tens of thousands, and we're in 300. How do we get from 300 to 3,000? Where at 3,000, we would be a, a very probably, we would expect to be a very profitable company uh, doing very good revenue with 3,000 customers because it's a razor, razor blade story. We sell the instrument, then we sell razor blades. We sell the, the test tubes, every sure. sample, every sample, every tissue, every sample has to have its own. So how do we get there? We're not going to get there doing what we did for the last 10 years by having one salesperson and sending out some emails. So we're taking a more proactive approach. We've, uh, we've, we've got to, and we waited until we knew that we had a base of key opinion leaders and we had a base of over 100 papers that talked about the advantages. And we have uh, a bunch of scientists that will take phone calls from others. And when all that happened, and then we took, then we invented and developed the next generation instrument last year that goes well beyond the one we've been selling for nine years. It all came together, and I said, you know, now is the time to hire the sales team to start getting the message out. Now is the time to do that, and so that's what we're doing. Wow, that sounds pretty pretty dramatic, uh, Charles. Uh, we only have about four minutes. Uh, any other questions? Not me. I like the. I like it. Michael, any uh, questions for Rick? Yeah, this has just been uh, phenomenal. I think um, we need to get more information out of what your 
machine does. Maybe you could give a further explanation. Uh, we, we we do, and uh, basically, I think in, in this for the last two minutes that we have for your for your listeners, every research scientist that's in the biological field, they're studying animals, plants, human samples, microbes, doesn't matter, Zika virus, uh, human cancer, uh, uh, pestilence on on wheat, doesn't matter. Generally, it starts by taking the cell, whether it's an, a virus, a bacterium, a fungus, or maybe it's a cell from the, from the plant or from the human, and, you, and all of the, the, the information we need is inside that cell for the most part. We need to break it. It's not sexy, but it's absolutely critical part of science, scientific research, breaking the cell. And inside that cell are as many as 10,000 different proteins and a thousand different lipid molecules and of course DNA and RNA. So you need to break the cell. Scientists are using methods that I used when I was in the, at Harvard Medical School 30 years ago doing research, beating the heck out of the cell. That's not the best way. The best way is to squeeze it like a sponge, which is what we do. We, we pressurize the cell, we squeeze it, we let it go, we squeeze it, we let it go until it breaks. We control the process, we, we harm the the materials, the biomaterials inside as little as possible so that we have a better chance of making that important discovery uh, to make that next drug. Boy, that sounds fantastic. Great. That sounds great, Rick. Uh, wh- what's your website? www, of course, uh, Pressure Biosciences with an S. PressureBiosciences.com. And the stock symbol? PBIO, Pressure Bio, PBIO. PBIO, pretty pretty easy there. All right. Hey, well, thank you uh, so much for being with us. And, uh, uh, hey, maybe you can uh, share some of those sales guys with us. Uh, we <laughs> we can use a few extra eyes on the street. No, that sounds like great news for you. I mean, that, that's uh, really, really phenomenal. Uh, uh, seeing that you've already got to start with some of the biggest universities in the world. I mean, uh, the only, only way yeah. to go is up, man. We do. We, we decided the best way to start is go after the key opinion leaders and get them, because when they go to a, 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 a symposium and they present a paper and say, I use pressure biosciences uh, PCT system, a lot of people listen and go, I got to find out. And that's how our sales have been, been growing for the last four or five years, since they didn't have a sales team by word of mouth. Now we have, we still have that, and now we have a sales team. Guys, Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great. I really, I always appreciate it. I really, uh, I really do. You bet. And, uh, hey, thank you very much, uh, Rick Schumacher, Pressure Biosciences. Thank you uh, very much for being with us. And, uh, Charles, any uh, final thoughts here? We have less than a minute. Um, Charles may have left. Oh, Charles may but, have left. Uh, okay, Michael. But um, <laughs> the markets look uh, very good. You know, the, the, they've uh, um, had like a 75% rally from the decline. We had a rather sharp decline, 11.8%, and we've uh, recovered uh, 75% of that. So the markets look pretty good as we go into spring. There you go, and that's uh, that's where we're going to be going uh, next week. I will not be here. I'm uh, with Indian River State College at the state basketball tournament. So uh, we'll be back live with Money Info the following week right here on uh, WPSL, Port St. Lucie, WPSL.com, webcaster to the world, WPSL on Google Home, on Alexa, and on Echo.